with the arrival of anatomically modern humans, Cro-Magnons, began the late, Upper Paleolithic, which lasted from 40,000 to 11,500 years ago. Like the previous and future historical and archaeological periods, these ranges can vary across the continent and the world, due to varying cultural and technological progress. Upper Paleolithic in the heart of Europe starts with the Aurig nation, which is characterized by the increased use of bone, antler, and ivory, especially as projectile points. Aurig nation hunters were careful at handling their weapons, maintaining, polishing and repairing points whenever possible. This was also a time of growing artistic achievements like cave paintings, figurines, and bone wind instruments. Tool production also developed, with the more economical blade napping that produced more usable stone blades from a single core. Following Aurignation was the Gravetian, which bruffed decline in bone point use, but brought new shapes of stone implements, with a tendency towards smaller size. This was a time of great migrations and exchange of ideas, all the way from the steppes of Eastern Europe to the Atlantic coast. Raw materials for producing tools were brought across large distances, hundreds of kilometers from their original deposit. Art continued to flourish in this period, as did other cultural aspects. Bodies of the deceased were often strewn with red ochre that was crushed into powder. Earliest ceramic artifacts have been found from this period. The peak of the last glacial period in the Ice Age hindered contacts between many areas. Such was the case with the Salutaran culture of Western Europe, which developed at the same time as Epigravetian or Late Gravetian. Contacts between the two were re-established with the melting of ice, resulting in the Magdalenian culture developing across Western and part of the Central Europe. Some areas avoided this however, as Epigravetian continued along with the Magdalenian culture. Throughout the Upper Paleolithic, tools became increasingly smaller, culminating in microliths small shards or bladelets used as arrowheads and barbs. Additionally, this era gives us the earliest evidence of domesticated dogs, about 15,000 years ago, which provided companionship, aid at hunting and alert them of danger. Both Magdalenian and Epigravetian mark the peak of the Paleolithic era in terms of cultural development and tool manufacture. According to the newest genetic research, the Magdalenian societies of Western Europe were largely replaced by the Epigravetian ones, about 14,000 years ago. With the end of the Ice Age of Pleistocene, around 11,500 years ago, came the post-glacial period of Holocene, the same geological period in which we live today. At approximately the same time, historians mark the end of the Paleolithic and the beginning of a new period, Mesolithic. In general it could be said that people continued to live as they did in the preceding Paleolithic, while the environment around them changed. The climate warmed, sea level had risen, lakes and marshes began to form, and forests like the mixed oak forest began to spread. Like ice caps that covered large chunks of Earth's surface, large animals like mammoths, hairy rhinos, and cave bears also disappeared. This was the era of the last hunter-gatherers in the heart of Europe. While such lifestyle didn't allow for permanent settlements, exceptional cases already began appearing during this time. Elsewhere in Europe, seasonal settlements and temporary camps sprung up, often near bodies of water. The production of microliths of the previous era continued in the Mesolithic. These came in varying shapes, from triangles to lunates or crescent-shaped. Sophistication of tool production enabled master crafters of Mesolithic to create retouched hypermicroliths, which were smaller than a fingertip. Harpoons also continued to see use, as did bone projectile points and bow and arrows. People perfected the fishhook, nets and baskets for fishing and created dugout canoes for transport. While toolmaking continued to evolve, Mesolithic art forms didn't reach the high levels of the Paleolithic, though the use of red and yellow ochre continued, as did the creation of jewelry and ornaments from seashells, snail shells, bone and stone beads. These objects could end up hundreds of kilometers away from their place of origin, through trade between multiple nomad parties. Not all exchanges were peaceful though. Warfare was widespread during the Mesolithic, as is indicated by numerous bludgeoning injuries and arrow wounds of discovered bodies. Mesolithic came to an end with the establishment of first permanent settlements, agriculture, and animal husbandry, which gradually spread from the Near East. Just as these elements didn't appear all at once, Mesolithic didn't end everywhere at the same time. Mesolithic stonework methods, like trapezoid microliths, continued into the Neolithic. But while the Mesolithic hunters used closest sites of flint, even if it was inferior in quality, 
Neolithic trade enabled imports of higher quality chert and other materials from far beyond. What we call now, the Neolithic Revolution, was a drastic change of the prehistoric lifestyle. People gradually abandoned their hunter-gatherer way of life, and started building permanent settlements. Instead of traveling to different areas in search for food, they started cultivating it right at their doorsteps. People went from passively benefiting from nature to actively transforming it. At first it concentrated in the areas with mild winters, like the Mediterranean, through which the new lifestyle spread relatively quickly. The other route of expansion was centered around the fertile plains with lurs soil, like the Balkans, and from there it continued to spread inland along major rivers, Danube, Rhone, Rhine. Waterways were the most important, if not the sole lines of communication with the wider world. Tents and makeshift wooden shelters of the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were now replaced by rectangular, sturdy buildings. Settlements could be protected by wooden palisades or stone ramparts and were often strategically placed along rivers or on hilltops. These hillforts would begin a trend that would continue throughout prehistory in the heart of Europe, until the arrival of Romans. It is however, the river bends that would be populated the most and over a longer period of time, due to good economic and strategic conditions. Around the Alps, the first piledwelling sites also sprung up. The new changes brought increased population, settlements and cemeteries. The cemeteries show us that the Neolithic people were smaller than their predecessors, and that not all changes were positive. People more often suffered tooth decay, a consequence of transitioning from a protein diet to one rich in carbohydrates. Field fertilizing increased intestine problems and parasite infections. The more densely populated villages also meant that sickness could spread faster. The new lifestyle, while increasing safety in numbers and in walled settlements, also brought increased and more intense workload on the people. At the start of the Neolithic, people would usually be buried inside their dwellings. In later cemeteries, several hundred people could be buried, most often placed on their side, in fetal position. A major part of them were children, sometimes even beyond one half of burials. The high fatality rate of children would remain a constant factor across most of history. People would be buried with jewelry, weapons, and pottery, containing meats and cooked plant-based foods for the afterlife. Fire hearths were found beside the cemeteries, which contained ceramic shards, burnt animal bones and cereals. These could either be the leftovers of a funerary feast, or later visits and offerings in memory of the dead. Cremation was very rare, but not non-existent. Despite food cultivation, hunting wild game continued to be an important source of sustenance. Besides food production, other technologies were also on the rise, such as pottery, through which we can separate Europe between three major culture groups, linear pottery, southeastern, and impressed wares. While these themselves had subgroups of regional variations, they possessed considerable relation of material culture, beyond just that of pottery. Advanced stonework brought in polished stone axes typical for this period. Additionally, the first protosicles, flint blades inserted into a wooden base, were developed in order to reap the grown crops. Obsidian was also a prized resource, especially in the central Mediterranean, where we can identify different exchange networks based on the unique chemical composition of material from different sources of the volcanic glass. Besides the technological innovations and development, it is also theorized that the first Indo-European languages were also brought into the continent with this spread. This theory, however, is still not confirmed and, for now, it is more probable that first such languages were brought into the continent during the following Copper Age by people of the Yamnair culture. Neolithic ended with the arrival of Metal Ages, with the Copper Age being the first one among them. Just like with the Neolithic, this transition wasn't sudden. Even more interestingly, at the transition period, in the millennium between 4800 and 3800 BC, Europe was split between the Western, Neolithic civilization, which was characterized by green jadeite axes, and the Eastern Copper Age civilization, with first products of gold and copper. These zones weren't singular civilizations per se, but more probably had two separate distribution systems. Between them, hillforts and protected settlements sprung up along the border regions, which often saw skirmishes and conflict between the two civilizations. The age of metal would usher in a new age of prosperity, with improved art and cultural aspects. New tools will enable the creation of new monuments and lifestyles. However, it would also bring new ways to wage war, conquer new lands, and subjugate other peoples.